you so much for joining us. My name is Rich Milner, and I direct the Center for Urban Education here at the University of Pittsburgh. I am also the Helen Faison Professor of Urban Education. And before we move on, I would like to take a moment and recognize Dr. Helen Faison, who passed away this July. Dr. Faison was a true trailblazer in Pittsburgh and beyond. Indeed, she was one of the first African-American teachers in the district and was both the first female and the first African-American to hold the position of high school principal and deputy superintendent. And she worked tirelessly to improve education in Pittsburgh. Please join me in a round of applause for Dr. Helen Faison. I say in many, in many ways, I am because of her. I am because of her. Uh, we are thrilled to see you uh, all here for what, is true, will, what will surely be uh, an engaging and thought-provoking lecture by Dr. Russ Skiba. I want to encourage you to live tweet uh, throughout this event. Our handle is PitQ. You see it up there? How many tweeters out there? Raise your hand. All right, good stuff, good stuff. I also want to uh, encourage you to follow uh, our center uh, now and go, actually do it now. Follow, follow us now. I want you to join. I want you to do it. I'm looking around the room. I want you to start following us now, right? We, we send out great information. We send out great information. Before we get into the main event, I want to give you some background on the history of the Center for Urban Education and tell you a little bit about the work we do. The School of Education, under the leadership of Dean Alan Lesko, first launched the Center for Urban Education in 2002 to help improve education in, in the Pittsburgh region uh, and to research and disseminate methods for improving urban education nationally. Since then, the Center has undergone a number of changes and we relaunched a new, with a new space in 2012. Our vision is for the center to be a transformative institution for asset-based discovery, knowledge sharing, and service to urban communities in order to improve educational experiences and the human condition. We frame our work around shifting the focus on urban education from achievement gaps to opportunity gaps, from deficits to assets, and from equality to equity. To frame these shifts, we conceptualize our work in three overlapping spheres, community partnerships, educator preparation, and academic and social development um, among students. These domains are anchored through what I like to call three P's and an E, the people, projects, products, uh, and events uh, that are integral to everything we do. Speaking of students, I'd like to invite Dr. I'm sorry, not almost Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ira Murray, K. Leroy Irvis Fellow, and a, who, who is also a student in social and comparative analysis of education, um, and a, also a Q doctoral research fellow, uh, to join me here uh, at the podium. He will do an introduction for our student performer. Let's give Ira a hand as he comes forward. Good evening. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our student performer for the evening, um, Mr. Rashad Edmondson. Uh, Rashad is a graduating senior at Barack Obama Academy of International Studies. He uh, is applying for several different schools right now, um, and his interest is in biomedical engineering, a lot smarter than I ever was. Um, Rashad is a part of One Nation Mentoring, um, and he's also a part of the We Promise um, African-American stu male student mentoring program. Um, he will be doing spoken word, uh, which he's been doing in and around the Pittsburgh area for the past two years. Uh, so without further ado, we welcome Mr. Rashawn Edmondson. Good afternoon. Um, when I was uh, asked to, to come here and uh, present to you, 
um, I had to find the inspiration. And it instantly came to me like that. And my inspiration was, I thought about myself before I came into the presence of so many uh, great mentors that I have, like Dr. Malcolm. And I was kind of lost. I didn't know where I came from. I didn't know where I was going. And then I got, into the pre I got to meet um, Dr. Malcolm. So my inspiration for this was just speaking to that person, that lost one that I once was. And my piece is titled, Letter to the Lost One. There will be many walls to climb over, many barriers to break down. I know your knuckles must hurt from breaking down so many barriers. I understand that you may have not been enlightened to the great things this world has to offer because all you are exposed to is the killings and the drugs that they throw on the scale to ensure temporary heaven and a permanent hell. My brothers and sisters, I come from the same situation. I currently walk through the streets of assumed devastation, past the blatant constructions of gentrification. It is compared to no man's land, the communities where we reside, because there are no places to hide. I know that you want to become better, my brother, but you don't want to be alone. You wouldn't dare to be different because nobody you knew took that chance. We rarely see success figures that will cause us to remember to do what we need to do for the future and not what we want to do in the present. Progression is key. Progression is a must. So many times in history we've been faced with adversity and we have overcome. Legend says that they have hidden many things from us in a paperback book. We need to open that up. That is the gateway to discoveries, education, and enrichment. And we must write and rhyme and sing. Write of the things that you go through, the struggles that you have, the love, the anger, the curiosity, you are not lost, young man. We are kings and your sisters are queens. You are not lost, young lady. Your lovers will always love you and your haters will always seem to hate you. But no matter where life takes you, always, always remember that greatness awaits you. Thank you for this opportunity. Rashawn, that was um, that was outstanding. Um, he came highly recommended, and we can see why, right? Um, so, on behalf of the Center for Urban Education, we'd like to thank you um, for sharing your gift with us today, and we'd just like to present you with a token of our appreciation. Um, it reads: Certificate of Appreciation on behalf of the University of Pittsburgh Center for Urban Education. We thank you, Rashawn Edmondson, for sharing your talents with us at the Fall 2015 Q Lecture Series recognized on this Thursday, October the 22nd, 2015, and signed by Dr. Richard Miller. Oh, y'all can do better than that. You can do better than that. Let's give her a sound of hand. Do better than that. Do better than that. Thank you so much, Rashad. Thank you. That was outstanding. That was outstanding. All right, so before I turn the microphone over to our distinguished speaker, I'd be remiss if I did not take the time to acknowledge a number of folks who make outstanding contributions to the work we do. I'd like to first uh, take this opportunity uh, to thank our donors who have demonstrated both their financial commitment and genuine belief in the work we do. Thank you to the Heinz Endowments, Carol and Jean McGrevin, Renee and Richard Goldman, the University of Pittsburgh Year of the Humanities, uh, Neighborhood Allies, and the over 125 donors who contributed to our Engage Pit campaign. Let's give them a hand. Everybody a hand. <laughs> 
A special thank you to Neighborhood Allies and the Year of the Humanities for so graciously providing funding for this event. We appreciate you. And because people are integral, to the, to, are integral to the work we do in the center, I would like to acknowledge some people who uh, support the center in extraordinary ways. I want to uh, begin by thanking uh, Dr. Erica Gold Kestenberg, wave Erica, who is our Associate Director of Community <laughs> Partnerships and Practice. In fact, I will ask that you hold your applause until I uh, have uh, recognized each person. Uh, we're working on a short time here, short, short time. Uh, Dr. Lori Delaley O'Connor, who is our Associate Director for uh, Research and Development. Gretchen, uh, Dr. Gretchen Hilder, I'm sorry, Dr. Gretchen <laughs> Generet. Uh, thinking about, we used to have a Hildebrand, now we have a Generet. Uh, Dr. Gretchen Generet, uh, who is Community Partnership and Fellow uh, here with us uh, this year. Please stand, y'all stand up, stand up so folks can see who you are. Uh, Dr. Abriola Ferrende, our postdoctoral research fellow and also Ready to Learn uh, program manager. Uh, Dr. Maxine McKinney de Royston, Ford postdoctoral research fellow who chose us uh, from Berkeley. So honored to have you with us. She's been value add in every way. Dr. Rod Carey, postdoctoral research fellow, value add in every way. Uh, Dr. Heather Cunningham, I got to say value add, add in every way, right? Uh, uh, folks are going to think I'm not being equitable. Um, Dr. Uh, Heather Cunningham, part-time faculty. Matt Wine, our new media arts and communications uh, coordinator. There's Matt. Um, Adam Alvarez, K. Leroy Irvis Fellow, student in SCAE and graduate assistant in Q. Uh, you just met Ira Murray, who is a K. Leroy Irvis Fellow, also student in SCAE. And I have to say all these things because if I don't, I'll get into trouble. So uh, I'm learning now to make sure I say the right things. And my team has, has said very clearly that I must stick to the, to the, strip, to the script. Uh, and our undergraduate work study student, Claire Dempsey. Uh, where is Claire? Claire is just Woo! exceptional. And Alex Leary, as well as Brandon Arsenault. Uh, so let's now take a moment to recognize these outstanding folks who go. Okay, you may sit. You may sit. No, uh, <laughs> these folks go above and beyond the call of duty, and I am so uh, lucky and I'd say blessed to work with each one of them. I'd also like to uh, uh, especially thank Susan Sherlock. Debbie Smell and everyone in the Dean's office for all of their support uh, as we search for our new center administrator. Uh, I don't see Susan, Susan here or uh, Debbie, but please let them know that we recognize them publicly. They have really uh, been uh, um, exceptionally supportive of us and I'm very grateful. Let's give the two of them a hand really quickly. Now, I'm going to ask for you to please hold your hand. And the reason I'm very, very meticulous and particular about recognizing folks is because I know what it means and I know what it feels like to give, 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 and never get thanks, right? So not necessarily here. But uh, yeah, and so I'm just very particular about and I'm very intentional about making sure I acknowledge folks, making sure I acknowledge people. And that's a lesson you can take with you, right? Lesson you can take with you. Amen? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Y'all can say amen or smile at me or something. Looking at me like I'm crazy. All right, so, um, so I'd like to now recognize a, another group, uh, several other groups, and I'm going to ask for you to please hold your applause again until uh, the folks have, have all stood uh, in unison, and then we'll, we will applaud them. Uh, the Center for Urban Education Advisory Board, if there are advisory board members here, please stand. The Center for Urban Education Faculty fellows, uh, faculty fellows, if there are faculty fellows here in the audience, please stand. Center for Urban Education uh, graduate student fellows, if you're in the audience, please stand. Uh, the ready to learn undergraduate scholars, if you're in the house, where are they? Undergraduate fellows, undergraduate scholars, where are they? Stand up, undergraduate uh, scholars. The Center, the School of Education urban scholars, where are the urban scholars? Please stand. Urban scholars there, okay. Uh, the School of Education, I said that, I right, can't say that again, Rich. Uh, so I want to uh, also recognize the uh, undergraduate, if there are high school ready to learn uh, students here as well, they're all, all together. Stand up, stand up, high school students, right? And from, uh, from our ready to learn our program. So let's take this opportunity now uh, to, to applaud all of these entities, all of these organizations. Collectively, 
All right, all right, right, right. Doesn't it make your heart glad when you see high school students here? That's what it's about. Now, I would also like to uh, take this time to thank my wife of 10 years uh, today, actually. This is our wedding anniversary. Uh, she has tolerated me for 10 years, 13 years, but we've been married for, for 10 years, and I'm very, very grateful that she allows me to do this work because she believes in this work, and I'm just very, very thankful uh, to her for allowing me to, uh, to be away, you know, um, and to just do the work. So I'm very grateful. Even on our wedding anniversary, I'm working. Even on our wedding anniversary, I'm working. So, so thank you. Thank you. All right. See, they made me do this, man. You made me, made me do, that, do that slide, but thank you for being here, Shelly. All right, so um, um, I don't even know where I am now. Uh, now I've got a transition. I've got a transition. Um, I'd like to now call Dr. Lori Delaney O'Connor up uh, to help me with a very, very special recognition. We are fortunate to have a strong support system that extends both in and outside of the university. Uh, and today we would like to recognize one individual who has consistently gone above and beyond uh, to uh, support our efforts in the center. Uh, this is a surprise, so this person doesn't know it. Um, but again, man, we have to thank people and we have to, to pour into folks who pour into us. Uh, and so I would like to ask uh, Mike Haas to please come forward. Uh, come on up, Mike. Give him a hand as he comes up. As, as soon as I arrived on campus, um, it became very, very clear that, that I had a friend, and we have a friend in Q uh, and Mike, man. So thank you for all you do uh, to support us and the work we do. Mike Haas is the Director of Constituent Relations at the School of Education, and he has been a champion for Q in so many ways. From our Engage Pit campaign to providing speaking opportunities for us, it is clear that he is on our side and working on behalf of, of, of teachers and students and community members uh, here in Pittsburgh. And so I just say thank you, Mike, for all you do. Thank you so much. You got me? All right, good, all right. <laughs> Let's give Mike another hand as he takes a seat. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So uh, this year, Q is launching a year-long thematic focus on disrupting a cradle-to-prison pipeline. Our goal is to increase societal and educational awareness, insights, and understandings of the many factors contributing to a pervasive pipeline of children and to the criminal justice system. As part of this focus, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Russell Skiba with us today. Dr. Skiba is a faculty member in the School of Education at Indiana University. He also serves as project co-director of the Equity Project. He's a nationally and internationally known scholar for his scholarship on school violence, school discipline, and classroom management and equity in education. Just within the past, the last two years, he has been invited to present at the National Leadership Conference on School Discipline and Climate, the annual convention of the American Psychological Association, and even as part of the Discipline Disparities, disparities Briefing uh, to congressional staffers. Although this gives you an idea of the work Dr. Skiba does, it does not fully capture the imprint, imprint he's made on schools and students. I would like to give you a sense of just how much this man and his work matter, straight from the people with whom he has worked most closely. Dr. Ann Gregory, Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology at Rutgers University shared, Russ's commitment to equity in school discipline rivals his unwavering commitment to his daughter's softball uh, career. <laughs> While that might be uh, saying a lot, on a more serious note, Dr. Mariano Arendo, 
uh, Associate Director of the Equity Project uh, for the Center for Evaluation and Education Policy at Indiana, at Indiana University School of Education Explain. I'm trying to move quickly so that we can get through everything. Slow down, Rich. All right, there are many people committed uh, to equity in education, but not many who can walk the talk the way Russ Skiba does. His commitment to equity manifests in the long hours he puts into researching issues of disproportionality and school discipline, and in his continuous work with the schools throughout the country. Those of us who work with him understand that his expectations for graduate st students and staff are high, but that he, he also is remarkably generous. He accepts nothing less than excellent work, and when things are not quite there, he takes the time to mentor and work alongside his junior colleagues and staff to get the work right. Equity work mandates, above all, a commitment to the possibility of justice. That commitment and his search for excellence inspires everyone who works with him at the Equity Project. I hope that these words demonstrate to you just who we have in our presence. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great uh, pleasure that I introduce and invite to the podium Dr. Russell Skiba. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if this is going to work. Hello? Hello? Is that that's coming through? Great. Good. Um, well, okay, you guys are going to, the softball and baseball theme, since we're talking here, you know. Uh, as a Mets fan, uh, all right. Um, well, it, 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 was, it was a fun night last night, and even better uh, when, uh, when we um, had four people come from New York who were Mets fans at our earlier, yes, yes, all right, let's go Mets. But, you know, it was... It was fascinating on that as as we were uh, as 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 we were taunting uh, a Phillies fan uh, and, and and Cubs fans. It, it it's amazing to me, you know. It, it says how we. Uh, this is really a kind of a central theme that I think as we get into later on our uh, our, our affiliation, our automatic tendency. We are a, we are a tribal. Um, we love to have tribes. We, we have our baseball uh, affiliations. Maybe in Pittsburgh we've got hockey, right? Um, football. All right, the Steelers. I forgot. How, yeah, anyway. Um, so, but, but, but that, and, and that, that's a, a great outlet for us, but it has also created, it has its dark side. You know, when we put together our tribal inclinations, with economic justifications early in our history, it led to the institution of slavery. Um, and two things that, that really, uh, to, to, that have, that haunt us even today. Um, a few years ago, when President Obama was elected, there were uh, commentators who said that we had entered an era of post-racial America, that, that we could put that aside now that we had a black president. But I think in the summer of 2014, we certainly were disabused uh, of that. We were disabused of the notion that, that that somehow race, uh, we had gotten past race in America, that the notion of race was not uh, something that needed to be talked about, that we could be race neutral in our approaches uh, to dealing with these issues. As we saw the, the, the shootings of, of Eric Garner and Michael Brown and others across the nation and the reactions across the nation. But there have also been uh, some positive and encouraging uh, events in the last few years, especially with respect. I'm here today to talk about disparities in school discipline, racial and ethnic disparities in school discipline. And in the last year uh, and a half, we have seen the United States government uh, issue a set of federal guidance to uh, schools 
to reduce the use of suspension and expulsion to address disparities. Uh, I'll be talking today about the work of the Discipline Disparities Collaborative, a national collaborative that released briefing papers. The U.S. Office of Civil Rights last March released its civil rights data collection. Uh, the Center, uh, the Council for State Government's Justice Center released its school discipline consensus project. And just this past summer, uh, the White House uh, held a conference on school discipline uh, with uh, representatives from states across the nation uh, called Rethink School Discipline. Um, so there's been a tremendous amount of, of work on this as well. So what I want to do today is start out talking about what we know about disparities in discipline uh, in our nation's schools, but also talk about uh, the importance of acknowledging race, uh, of, of working on the problem that, that we're trying to fix. Um, what do we know about discipline disparities? First of all, that these are problems that, are, that have endured and are expanding. These are data from uh, 1973 and the 2006 uh, Office for Civil Rights, Civil Rights Data Collection. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, I wonder if we got a pointer on this. Oh, there's even a pointer. That's wonderful. So uh, in, in um, 1973, 6 percent of all kids in school, black kids in school, were suspended as opposed to 3.1 percent of white kids. So blacks twice, about twice as likely. Um, by 2006, we saw increases in suspension for all racial and ethnic groups but especially uh, almost a tripling of the rate for black students so that it went from twice as likely to be suspended out of school to about three times as likely. Those data have continued. That, that gap has continued to expand so that now blacks are three and a half times as likely as white, whites to be suspended in our nation's school. We've also learned that there are other groups at risk, that Latino students' uh, risk may increase over time. They tend to be underrepresented in uh, elementary school, but overrepresented in middle and high school. Um, students with disabilities uh, are likely to be uh, oversuspended. And if we cross that with race uh, and gender, fully one quarter of black males with disabilities um, can expect to be suspended. One quarter, 25 percent. Um, we focus a lot on black males. But uh, as we've talked about as an, at a number of our uh, meetings today, the issue also expa expa ah, excuse me, expands to, to uh, black females as well. While the absolute rates for uh, black males are the highest in terms of suspension, the gap between black females and white females is actually bigger than the gap between black and white males. And then finally, we have emerging data that uh, LGBT students are at, at risk as well for increased suspension. So this is not just you know, one group. This is, we put all this together. There are a, a, a lot of groups in our schools who are being marginalized by higher rates of suspension and expulsion, higher rates of removal for school discipline. And I think I skipped over something. Um, well, is this uh, effective? Well, um, in fact, the American Psychological Association and others have found that, that, that no, um, that, that suspension and expulsion do not make our schools safer or in, increase, uh, uh, improve student behavior and have, have recommended that we reduce that. But more importantly, those suspensions and expulsions increase the risk for a number of, of uh, factors across the lifespan. Schools with harsher discipline policies and higher uh, out-of-school suspension rates are perceived as less safe. Um, students who are suspended uh, have, we know that, that, uh, that the strongest predictor of academic achievement in our, in our schools is simply being engaged. Duh, right? So, so, so what do we think about uh, a, 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 an intervention that removes kids from the opportunity to learn? Uh, and so it's not surprising that for African American males, more suspensions predict lower achievement in school engagement. Um, school dropouts, suspended and expelled students 
uh, are five times as likely to drop out. This was from a national study done by the Council for State Governments. Controlling for 80 demographic variables, those kids who were suspended were still much more likely to, to drop out. Black males are twice as likely to drop out for discipline reasons. And finally, it's not surprising if we put all these things together that kids who are suspended are at increased risk for involvement with the juvenile justice system. Um, one of the reactions, uh, and, and any time you see a blog about this, whether it be the civil rights uh, data collection or the work of the Discipline Disparities Collaborative, you always see somebody saying, well, yeah, duh. Uh, black kids are more likely to be suspended. Kids of color are more likely to be suspended. They're coming from single family homes, you know, fathers in prison. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's all well and good, except the data just doesn't support that. Um, can poverty explain disproportionality? Well, discipline is related to poverty. Kids from poor backgrounds are more likely to get in trouble at school. Um, but it's not a huge it's, it's, it's significant, but it's not a huge correlation. And when we put those things together in the same equation, what we find out is the effect of race remains even after we control for poverty. So yes, poor kids are suspended more, but you know, uh, black kids in urban poor settings are more likely to be uh, suspended than their white peers, but also middle class black kids are more likely to be suspended than their white peers. Also, uh, upper class kids in the best schools, black kids are more likely to be suspended than their white peers. So it's not just a matter of poverty. Um, is it a matter of misbehavior? Do black kids misbehave more in order to be suspended more? Um, we did a study on this called The Color of Discipline. We looked at 19 middle schools in a, in a large urban uh, uh, school district and looked at what they were referred to the office for. Uh, there were 32 different infractions in, I don't want to be biased against this side of the room, so I'll walk over here. Um, there were 32 different fractions. Out of, out of those, there were, uh, many of them were not significant. There were no differences for fighting. There were no differences for weapons. There were no, no differences for spitting. You'd be pleased to know there was no difference in between rates of black and white spitting. Uh, in this school system, but there were uh, eight differences. Uh, white students were more likely to be referred to the office for smoking, for vandalism, for leaving without permission, and for obscene language. Black students were more likely than white students to be referred more for disrespect, excessive noise, threat, and loitering. What do you notice about those differences? Somebody shout it out. Subjective, yeah. I mean, really, it's hard to say. Is is you know, is is smoking more or less serious than disrespect? Is vandalism more or less serious than threat? Threat might be pretty serious, but what is clear is that the things here on this side demand that there be a subjective judgment made about that. You know, even threat could be serious, but it still depends on the perception of the person being threatened, right? And this, this data has been replicated over and over again. Uh, in short, there is, is no data that African American students in the same districts and same schools are engaging in more severe behavior in order to be uh, uh, punished more severely, as is commonly the case. We're going to return to this because this is really interesting, and the reactions that um, to this work are interesting. Um, and fourth, what we know is that schools can make a difference. Um, we did a, a study looking at, at all of the uh, different reasons why a kid might be suspended. I mean, the common rap is that uh, you know, a kid comes in and they engage in some misbehavior, and the teacher says, recognizes that, uh, refers the kid to the office, and the principal makes a decision. It's a kind of you know, linear process, one step the, after the other. In fact, it's a whole lot more complicated than that. It depends on teacher tolerance. It depends on uh, the, the, the policies of the school district. It depends on uh, the attitude of the principal. What we found was that, yeah, 
kids who engage in more serious behavior are more likely to be suspended, but also blacks and males and kids with disabilities are more likely to be suspended. And also, uh, schools that have higher rates of black enrollment are likely to use more suspensions, and schools with principals who uh, support zero tolerance are more, more likely to um, suspend more kids. In fact, if you, as a, uh, as a kid here, attend a school with higher black enrollment, um, you're five times as likely to be suspended as you would be in a school with lower black enrollment. That's about the same uh, odds ratio as fighting. So, you know, if you want to decrease your odds of being suspended, you should either not fight or you should move to a school with lower black enrollment. Um, in Chicago, uh, Steinberg and her colleagues uh, looked at, at the contributions of schools and they matched schools with demographics and these were in tough neighborhoods, but they matched the schools and they found that, that among these schools, more suspensions led to lower feelings of safety. So there were some schools in the same demographic, in the same neighborhood, um, with the same level of, of community issues that chose to use less suspension. And in those schools, kids felt more safe. And they found that the, what, was, what predicted safety um, were relationships between the teachers, the students, and the parents. And in fact, those things were more important in predicting whether folks in the school felt safe than the neighborhood crime and, and poverty. So I want to talk, um, uh, uh, move in a, in, a, in a slightly different direction here. Uh, the Discipline Disparities Collaborative was a group of 26 uh, um, researchers, advocates, policy analysts, um, from around the country who met to um, talk about where we're at with respect to understanding school discipline and what we could do in terms of encouraging interventions. And so as a, uh, that uh, collaborative put out a series of four briefing papers and I'd encourage you to check out the website. There, there's a lot of good resources in there. It just if you uh, Google Discipline Disparities Collaborative, it should, it should pull that up. Uh, the four papers were in the area of interventions, uh, research, um, policy, and then supplementary materials uh, uh, on what we've been talking about, dis discipline disparities due to differences in behavior, implicit bias, and myths and facts of disciplinary disparity. But one of the things that came up over and over and over again was there was a tendency to say, to, to think about race-neutral interventions. Well, let's just put in place positive behavior supports or social-emotional learning or uh, uh, restorative justice and see if that fixes the problem. But there are deeper issues uh, about race that those things don't address. And so over and over again in our, in our conversations, we realized we also wanted to put out a paper that said, you know, we need to face this directly. We need to acknowledge the importance that race itself plays in racial disparities. So a fourth paper was, was developed, uh, uh, Prudence Carter, uh, myself, and Micah Pollack called You Can't Fix What You Don't Look At, Acknowledging Race and Addressing Racial Stereotypes. Uh, and there are three sections to that, how we got here, uh, what, it, what led up to that, the history and stereotypes, how those are perpetuated by our failure to communicate, um, the fact that, that these old patterns, because uh, we haven't effectively communicated, still continue, and what should we do bringing our conversations uh, into disparity. So I'll, I'll talk about, about that paper. You know, when we think about race, we think about, you know, most of, I'm sure everyone in this room has gotten over the notion that, that race is a biological um, construct, but, but race was developed in conjunction with racism. Race, the notion of race and racism are not separate from each other. Race grew up because there was an economic system that required us to invent the notion of race. Um, Noel, a historian in 1972 says, the sharp inconsistency, indeed the blatant clash between slaveholding, sorry things kind of got cut off there, 
and Christian values in a Christian society necessitated a racist ideology to justify and thereby assure preservation of a profitable institution which overtly des denied these central values. So if we're going to, to treat people, to oppress people, to do things that, that would shock a Christian conscience, it's important, it was important to define though the oppressed as lower beings, as folks who didn't deserve these rights. And so the notion of race emerged in this country out of that clash of values in order to, um, and you know, it, it had to be irremediable. It had to be something that couldn't be changed. Hegel, this was a, you know, it's interesting, our, our, our core philosophers, Hegel, Locke, all of these folks fully believed in that. Uh, it wasn't something that could be, could be changed. Intractability is the distinguishing feature of the Negro character, Hegel said in, in, in 1822. The condition in which they live is incapable of any development or culture, and their present existence is the same as it has always been. One of these Enlightenment thinkers was our own Thomas Jefferson, uh, who wrote the soaring words of the uh, Declaration of Independence. Well, uh, Jefferson also wrote a book called uh, Notes on the State of Virginia for uh, a visiting French delegation, um, in part to, pr to, to promote the notion that we weren't a bunch of country rubes, but we had culture. But he had a 10-page uh, section on slavery with pretty tortured logic. Um, but he advanced it as a suspicion that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race, or made distinct by time and circumstances are inferior to the whites in the endowments of both body and mind. Thomas Jefferson was the father uh, of our Declaration of Independence, but he was also the most influential natural historian of our time, and so scientists throughout the 19th century looked to him uh, to say, well, sure, let's go ahead and prove that there is uh, there are differences of both body and mind between blacks and whites. So he was also the father of scientific racism um, in our country, quite literally. Uh, and that, that led to, uh, by the end of the 19th century, not just a suspicion, as, as Jefferson had said, but a surety that there was, in fact, black superiority. And that, that surety um, further uh, changed policy, further oppressed African Americans in this nation. In Plessy v. Ferguson, the, the, uh, the court decided that separate but equal was the law of the land, and they based it upon the science of the last century, saying if race be in, one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of the United States cannot put them on the same plane. So, you know, all of this, this, this history, this kind of hangover, of history sticks with us. And, and every time I present this data here, I, I feel like I got an ESP, you know? I feel as if there are folks in the audience that are saying, no, that can't be right. That can't be right that, that black students don't misbehave more than white students. He hasn't been in my district, has he? You know? It, it, so why is it? I mean, the data, th this, is, this is one of, of many studies that, that, that has found that there is not a difference in the same schools in the same district. Why don't we believe it? And I think we have to start saying, well, maybe it goes back in our history. Maybe that's what we've believed for a long, long time and still can't let ourselves stop believing. It does go back a long, long time. The, the myth of the dangerous black male. Um, if we think about it, in the 17th century, slavery developed in the last part of the 17th century, from the middle of the 17th century on, uh, Massachusetts was the first per place to put in place slave codes. It made any normal act a crime, you know. Um, uh, slaves couldn't marry, they couldn't learn to read, they couldn't congregate. So that really, you know, any normal act, any normal function became a criminal action. You were a, a, a criminal to engage in what we would do as human beings. In the 1830s, um, we began to see the rise of abolition and the, uh, uh, 
slave rebellions, such as Nat Turner's rebellion. Well, this the slaveholders got pretty freaked out about this. You know, this is this is their livelihood. This is their their live their their institution was under attack, and so it became necessary to portray escaping slaves not as those escaping oppression into freedom, but as dangerous perpetrators uh, that, that would, if given the opportunity, rape our white women. And that, that was, was consciously um, spread by the, the slaveholders along with the rise of the Knight Riders that later became the Ku Klux Klan to, to chase those, those escaping slaves down. Early criminology in the, the 19th century um, also uh, uh, spread the notion um, that Lombroso, who was considered the father of criminology, was convinced that race was conditioned, uh, uh, that crim crime was conditioned upon race. Uh, and Frederick Hoffman, the leading demographer of his time at the end of the 19th century, put out a 300-page volume um, showing that the, the black race was inherently criminal and, in fact, was so criminal that we would expect that the black race would... Um, by the end of the 20th century, go extinct. So there's one prediction that didn't happen anyway. Um, William Penn, in uh, uh, 1700, introduced a law that said if any Negroes uh, were to rape or ravish a white woman, uh, there were pretty severe punishments by death. Uh, and, and punished by castration. There was very, this happened, this was very, this was almost unheard of um, in 1700. But by putting this into law, it set the notion forward. William Penn, the, the founder of your state here, uh, right? This is especially meaningful here, um, helped perpetrate this notion of, of blacks as rapists and criminals. It starts pretty early in our history um, and continued on. Birth of a Nation in 1915. How many of you are familiar with, with Birth of a Nation? In, in, in terms of, of, of filmmaking, it is the beginning of modern filmmaking. But in fact, Birth of a Nation has a pretty interesting storyline in it. Uh, it's about a, a, a black sergeant who returns home from the Civil War. Uh, he comes to a, a, a white woman and says, you know, I'm, I'm a sergeant now. I'm I'm, I'm going to have some property here, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very interested in you. Would you be interested in, in marrying me? And so she is absolutely horrified by this notion and runs away, and he chases her. Now, notice, notice this is not really a, a, a true black man, but a white man in, in, in blackface here. Um, but this monster is chasing her through the woods, chases her to the edge of a cliff, and she threatens him and says, uh, if you don't stop pursuing me, I am going to jump, and does jump to her death. Um, the heroes, the Ku Klux Klan, track this uh, monster down and leave him dead on the doorsteps of the, of the governor's office. Um, Woodrow Wilson, saw a, uh, a pre-screening of this, the President of the United States, in 1915 and said, it is like writing history with lightning, and my only regret is that it is all so terribly true. So we were so convinced, this was so much part of our national fabric um, this, this, that had become the, the dangerous black man. As a result, we as a nation um, engaged in the most horrific uh, acts that, that we had seen, the nadir of, uh, of race relations th through lynching um, in order to combat this. Between 1889 and 1918, more than 2,500 black men were lynched. The majority were, even, even in the record books themselves, there were very few lynchings that were for rape. The majority were for disputing a white man, asking for a white woman's hand in marriage, peeping in a window. G. Stanley Hall was the founder of the American Psychological Association. He's often noted, noted as the, the, the father of psychology. He graduated nine of the first 17 PhDs in psychology. Um, Hall said in a, in a speech 
uh, in, at the University of Virginia in 1905 as a preventive of crime. Lynching has something to be said for it, but more to be said against it. The, this wild justice is brutalizing upon those who inflict it, who are usually young men and boys. So the problem wasn't the black men who were lynched. The problem was that the white boys had to see this. So what are, wh where, where does this leave us today? Have, have these, are, do these stereotypes still exist? Well, they seem to. Uh, Officer Darren Wilson, talking about Michael Brown, said he looked up at me and had the most aggressive face. The only way I can describe it is he looks like a demon. That's how angry he looked. He comes back toward me again with his hands up. Um, Phil Goff uh, at UCLA, uh, and I encourage you to check this out in a 2008 article, um, uh, looked at uh, a stereotyping and used an implicit bias, uh, kind of automatic linking of words and faces, and found that, in fact, um, black faces were much more likely than white faces to be associated with words linked to ape or gorilla. And he tested that again and said, well, maybe it's just, you know, maybe that's just an animal thing. So he tested it again with, with big cats versus apes for, for black faces. And again, found that black faces were not associated with big cats, but were associated with um, apes and gorillas in this implicit matching test. So these things are buried deep in our consciousness and remain there today. They've been put there. So, you know, we, we reached a point with Brown versus Board of Education in, in 1954 where that should have been turned around. You know, the, the, the theory behind Brown was contact theory, that if we all um, were in contact with each other more, if we became integrated, if our schools were integrated, that's an opportunity for us to uh, get past all of this, to, to experience each other, to see that those stereotypes don't really make any sense when we're in real contact with each other. And that worked for a few years. As Gary Orfield said, all three houses of, of all three branches of government were on board with integration from Brown versus Board of Education till the late 60s. But starting in the late 60s, the, school, the courts and the Nixon administration started rolling that back. And as a result, we've seen reseger and saying that, you know, we, we can't have uh, uh, our, our approaches to integration have to be race neutral and essentially didn't work. What, what has happened is that now African American and Latino students attend schools that are 60% students of color while white students attend schools that are on average 77% white. As a result, uh, we see school inequality in facilities, curriculum, technology, teacher certification, extracurricular activities, and school punishment. But just as importantly, we don't have the opportunity to, to engage in the types of dialogues that we were supposed to engage in under contact theory. We, both, we all saw the same incidents in Ferguson um, on TV, but we didn't all react the same way. Um, this is a ABC News poll conducted in uh, November after uh, uh, the grand jury refused to bring uh, uh, criminal charges against uh, Darren Wilson. And what you found was that some 58% of whites approved of that verdict. Only 9% of African American respondents approved of that verdict. So we, we approach, and, and if, we, if we go back, if we look at, at the Reverend Wright controversy in 2008, or Rodney King, or O.J. Simpson, we always see these huge disparities in how we view the world, whether we're white or black. Um, and so Prudence um, ha has argued in that, in that paper that really we haven't had the opportunity because we have remained segregated, because our schools have remained segregated and boundary. We haven't had the opportunity to talk about those racial stereotypes that are buried so deep within us, and so they remain. Well, how do they remain? How do they, how do they come out? 
Well, one of the ways is through implicit bias. Social preferences that exist outside of our conscious awareness. Biases that we're not even aware that we have. Now, this, this is a, I encourage you to look at a, look at a um, website on YouTube, well, actually a, a YouTube site uh, called Bike Thief, uh, ABC News. So what happens is they set up these, th this, uh, this kid here in Central Park, this is a, 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 a white man, and he's got himself a pair of chain cutters, bolt cutters, and uh, there's a bike chained up there, and he starts cutting the bolts. And passers-by look at him and say, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm cutting through this chain. Well, why? Well, I want to take this bike. Uh, is it your bike? Um, not really. <laughs> and so, you know, people would pass by, and, you know, they'd kind of question him, and some of them would look funny, and, you know, but, but they'd kind of go on in Central Park. Nobody would take... So then, the exact same scenario with a black man, kind of dressed the same way, same chain cutter, same bike, same questions, you know. Is, 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 what are you doing? Well, I'm cut, cutting this chain. Uh, why? Well, you know, I want to take the bike. Is it yours? Well, not really. All of a sudden, a crowd forms. You have 25 or 30 people around that man. Some people actively tried to stop him. One person got on the phone and called 911. So now, we have a white woman, and a blonde white woman who comes with the same scenario with her bolt cutters. What do you think happens? <laughs> nothing, not nothing. <laughs> Not one, not, not one, but two men offered to help her. <laughs> so no, there's no implicit bias in, in our nation, is there? Um, uh, Banaji and, and their colleagues have, have um, uh, tested implicit bias through Project Implicit. And I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's, it's, it presents pictures, black and white faces, and in a speed test, asks one to associate those with different words. If you have not gotten on and taken the test on Project Implicit, I'd uh, suggest it. It's really enlightening. Um, and what they have found um, is that implicit bias has been found consistently even among individuals of color. Um, not as strongly among individuals of color, but it's been found consistently uh, about um, uh, well over, uh, we're talking about 70% have an automatic preference for white people compared um, uh, to black people. Um, early findings of, of, of work from Phil Goff uh, and Patricia Devine have found that it is possible to do trainings that, that can Im, uh, overcome implicit bias. Well, we wanted, we, we did some work uh, in um, some, we, we wanted to look more closely. We had done some previous work uh, documenting the extent of disciplinary disparities in our schools, and we wanted to look more closely at why that was the case. So we visited a number of, of schools. Um, Rich, how am I doing on time? Am I over? Eight minutes? Okay, I won't be able to get through it all. Um, so um, we were asking teachers about, you know, what their 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 reason, what why they thought there was disproportionality in discipline uh, at their schools, and the the responses we got were pretty darn interesting. Um, one classroom teacher said, you know, their home environment, you know, they're very verbal, their parents, these, these, these are why black girls are so loud. It's just how they were raised, you know, so they're used to talking, they're used to talking to other people, and like, you know, maybe their parents are constantly yelling at them, so they're used to yelling too. Another teacher said it's a cultural thing. You don't want your child sitting next to somebody who's going to completely distract them and say all kinds of profane words in the middle of class, and that's a cultural thing. Now, this was, these were outside observers coming in the first time to, to meet with these teachers, and these are the kind of things they said. Um, this one teacher is commenting on sports. They all think like that. We had a dad in here that played college ball. I remember him saying to his son, I'm not afraid to take you out of sports if you can't behave in school. Never happened. 
American, African American fathers care too much about sports. Now, I'm coming from Indiana, and I got to tell you, the white parents don't care about sports like that, you know, you know in Indiana. No. Just the black parents. I think it's just learning how to adapt. We heard this a lot, how to adapt to this environment, especially coming, if you're coming from an all-black environment to this environment. It's totally different. It's totally different. So how does this translate into action? You know, these are just attitudes. Do they translate into action? Okanafua and Eberhardt just um, uh, did a, a study that just fascinating in, in um, uh, psychological science, 2015, two strikes in the disciplining of young children. All they did was very, they presented vignettes of two incidents of, of behavioral disruption. And they just varied the name. So, you know, their black kid might be called Deshaun, and their white vignette would be called Greg. But other than that, everything was the same, just with the name change. Now, there was no difference between these on the first infraction, but by the second time these named kids, uh, the, the black kids, engaged in this, they identified the black kid as more troubled, more likely that they would discipline them, describe the child as a troublemaker, saw the data as a pattern, and were more likely to recommend suspension. So it's, it's the beginning of work that says implicit bias really can have an impact on school discipline. Um, we see color blindness in the classroom, you know, that, that our, our teachers are really unwilling. It's, it's tough for us to talk about. Um, when we say, say minorities, what are you speaking of? Well, uh, ethnic and racial minorities, I guess we have half and half. I never paid attention. You have half and half and you haven't paid attention to it? Um, but somehow that still comes through. It sort of leaks out the edges. I mean, this person says, I don't see color as being the issue. I think a lot of the issues, they come from perhaps the fact they're in a black situation over here. I don't see color as being an issue, but they're coming from a black situation. It, it leaks out the edges. And, and what's important is when it leaks out the edges, kids see it. This is a kid who, who, who um, identified by Tyrone Howard. He's played football, but he's also on student council, as great, is a school leader, good grades, going on an academic scholarship, and they look at you like, whoa, I didn't think they were into those kind of things. One teacher even told me once, you're not like the rest of them. I didn't ask her what that meant, but believe me, I knew what that meant. So, you know, as James Baldwin said, not, not everything can be faced, that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. We need to address these issues. Recommendations for how to do that. I'm not going to have enough time to go through these things in detail, and it's, it's, it's lists, so it would probably be boring anyway. I'd encourage you to, to look more closely at the paper. I think um, many of you have had it. You can find it on the Discipline Disparities website. Uh, um, uh, 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 and you, it, uh, you can't fix what you don't look at. But essentially, the recommendations break down into four steps. First of all, to look at our data, to say how extensive and where are the racial ethnic disparities. Don't just look at our suspension data and say we've got X number of suspensions, but who is being suspended? Be willing to discuss the disparities and their causes thoroughly and reflectively. Not just say these are kids who uh, are coming from bad backgrounds, but what is our responsibility as a school for doing this? To develop interventions that include a race conscious analysis of causes, to understand that, that race neutrality hasn't gotten us anywhere in fixing these issues, and to monitor our intervention outcomes with disaggregated data. To not be satisfied that, um, uh, that, that we are reducing suspensions, but to make sure that's working for all groups and to be willing to have the courageous conversations that we need. And there's um, lots of suggestions throughout the paper on how to, to conduct those things, to acknowledge that this is an area in which mistakes will be made, to acknowledge that we'll have discomfort, and to have facilitators who model a commitment to um, solving the problem and take advantage of race teachable moments. So there's a lot of points here that you can read about in there. But, you know, there was a rally held last December um, 
in Washington, D.C., a Black Lives Matter rally. And I just found it, I was, I, I, my mom um, was visiting at the time, my 92-year-old mom, and she keeps CNN on all the time, 24-7. So whatever the current issue uh, is, you know, when it was a Malaysian jet aircraft, I learned so much about flight recorder boxes in, those, in, in the week she was around. But fortunately, this time she was around, uh, CNN was covering the Black Lives Rally Matter, and it was just so inspiring, the Black Lives, rally, Black Lives Matter rallies. It was so inspiring to me to see that. Um, and, you know, I, I think we, again, we have to think about these things in terms of the span of time. Um, this is not an issue that started yesterday or 40 years ago. Um, you know, state-sponsored discrimination took place over a period of 355 years um, from, if we count, say, the late 1600s till when, when the Supreme Court really ended uh, uh, segregation. Since its end, it's only been about 40 years. It wasn't Brown versus Board of Education that outlawed segregation. They said you have to end it with due deliberate speed, whatever that is. But in 1969, in a case called Alexander versus Holmes County Board of Education, is when the Supreme Court finally said, stop, enough, you know, enough segregation, stop it, stop it now. So that's not that long ago. It's about a tenth of the time in this country that we haven't had state-sponsored segregation and discrimination as compared to the time we had. So, so why would it be surprising that both our institutions and our perspectives, our thoughts, our, our, our very belief system would not be colored and influenced by that history? And more importantly, how do we encourage reflection on unintended consequences of our actions to keep from reproducing our history? As Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I hope that. I know from being here today and seeing the commitment uh, here today that you all are working to bend that arc, arc towards justice. Thanks very much. Said it was on. It's on now. Um, I don't know if it's better with or without, but a group of high school students work with Michael. They have presented to the school. Do you see a Times that I want to ask this question. <laughs> okay, uh, we've had a group of high school students who've been doing a lot of work on microaggression, and uh, it's been really interesting to see them present this to adults in the organization. Do you see a relationship between microaggression and the disparity in discipline? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, as I said, it's not it's not a it's not this linear process um, between uh, a, a kid misbehaving and uh, they're winding up in the office. Um, that it it um, I, I think implicit bias plays itself out in in microaggression, um, and kids are aware of that. I have, I have one colleague. You know, I, I've often thought about um, 
defiance as a misunderstanding of, of or, or, or a mismatch, cultural mismatch um, between white teachers and not understanding uh, the expression of students of color. But I have one colleague of color who said, well, actually, defiance, referrals for defiance could really be defiance, that, that being faced with microaggression after microaggression after microaggression, that kids simply get tired of this, and we actually do see um, a higher level of, of, of defiance there. Um, so, so absolutely, I think the microaggressions um, absolutely contribute. So, you can't take just one more, Rich. Sure. Okay. Make it a good one. And then I'm going to ask him if we can take one more after that, and one more after that. And I'm wondering um, how we map this issue of uh, uh, discipline disparities onto um, issues like um, health initiative, health disparities in this sense. When we have research that shows that there are certain things that cause uh, health conditions and desire, undesirable health conditions, we're able to take that research and translate it there's a long process, but we translate it into policies that affect practices. So we have people in, it, in um, the legislature at all levels, in society throughout, getting their prostate exams. You know, we get the stuff about the blood pressure. So that research that happens in those fields eventually finds its way into society across the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people have the information and may use it. Mm -hmm. you know, to actually better their lives and, and, you know, the lives of the public health of the community. I see a sort of parallel in that we're having some difficulty, you know, the research that you're talking about, countless studies, we know it, the history, we know it, but we have difficulty taking this information and making sure that people who, who populate all of these areas where they make policy, enact laws, act in their everyday lives, will actually use it. Mm -hmm. So in university settings, we generate this research, but people in the university settings don't even apply it in their own context. Yeah. Then we have teachers who are the teachers of the teachers who don't follow through on teacher education. We have people coming into the setting where they don't know this and we can't expect for them to know this. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we get it into the, into the classroom setting. And many parents aren't even aware of how systemic and, and um, infectious this is so they want their kids to do well in school and they just tell the kids you know behave I don't want to have to you know deal with this you're bringing it home so right. we have the information but how do we sort of like turn translate it we need some translational science in here so that everybody is sort of forced to take their implicit racism test or get their vaccine or whatever you know I sort of <laughs> see this parallel yeah um. Yeah, you know, that is, that is an excellent point. But, you know, I, I, I think the one thing, I don't want to leave us um, on, on, a, on a hopeless note here either. Is, is, and maybe I should have put the slide about policy changes uh, that I showed at the beginning um, at the end. It actually has been a remarkable two or three years in terms of changes from research to policy. Certainly the, the folks within the Department of Ed and Department of Justice get it. Now they have been influenced um, by the research. Uh, the fed, you know, they've put out a set of, of federal guidance. Uh, the the uh, the White House had the rethink school discipline. There are some between 17 and 25 states that have now changed their, um, their, their, their school discipline laws to say we need to reduce suspensions and expulsions and put in place alternatives. We have major districts around the country, um, Denver, Oakland, San Francisco, Baltimore, that have changed their codes of conduct. Um, we really are at a point right now, though, where we need to, to ask our policymakers to put their money where their mouth is and to say, okay, you know, you're saying we need the support, but we need to change, but how are we going to get support to our schools? How are we going to get the in-service and pre-service training to our teachers? How are we going to get them the release time they need to learn the new systems? Um, how, what kind of resources are we going to get 
to get to to so that they can put in place PBIS, restorative justice, social emotional learning. That's the crux of the matter right now. It, but but we have made we have made um, some great progress and great strides in the last three years. It's just a matter of can we get it into our schools and our institutions of higher education. You're absolutely right. Okay, please don't leave. I promise to have you out of here in seven minutes. Can you hang with me seven minutes? I want to take this opportunity to uh, invite Dr. Skiba back to the front very briefly. We have just a token of our appreciation to present to you. We hope that you will take this back on the plane with, you know, we'll mail it to you. Uh, but we're hoping that you will, uh, this will remind you of your time here at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. Thank you so much for being here. So much. Thank you. I just also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Dr. Linda Lane, who is here with us. We are fortunate to have a superintendent who shows up and shows out. So I'm very, very grateful to you. I'm very grateful to you uh, for being here. Uh, so, so now we will transition here just a bit. And uh, when the Center for Urban Education was founded in 2002, uh, it was because of the vision of one man, and that is Dean Alan Lesko. Dean Alan Lesko was honored uh, last fall. We honored him with a certificate, uh, with a plaque. And the Alan Lesko Award, award uh, was established. The Alan Lesko Award for Excellence in Urban Education is presented to an educator, leader, or community member who demonstrates outstanding work and commitment to innovation and improvement in urban education. Each awardee is given a plaque and a modest honorarium. Today, we are fortunate to have two individuals whose work exemplifies this commitment. Our first award recipient is a true champion <laughs> of urban education in Pittsburgh and beyond. Malcolm Thomas has worked with and for the Pittsburgh Public Schools for over 17 years and has been involved in education for more than two decades. He began his career in urban education with the Hill House Association Young Mothers and Young Fathers Program. Through positions with the Mother to, Mother to Son Program and organizations like Rites of Passage, Mercy Health Systems, and the National Council for Urban Peace and Justice, Mr. Thomas gained a greater appreciation for holistic health. Mr. Thomas began, became known for using racial identity and culture as a primary tool or as primary tools for optimizing wellness and performance while integrating effective tools such as music, journaling, poetry, drama, movement, and group work to provide holistic student development. He currently is the director of the Sankofa Leadership Institute and a member of the African American Men and Boys Task Force Advisory Board, both of which aim at building capacity of black men and boys across the region. He works closely with his wife, Sister I, let's give her a hand as well, <laughs> and several other initiatives including We Promise, Office of College and Career Readiness, HDEC, and Office of Equity to fight for quality education and life preparation for all urban students. While he's worked among a community of truly dynamic and committed leaders, he counts as his greatest accomplishments, his roles as a husband, father, brother, and son. Please join me and giving a warm round of applause for the recipient of the 2015 Alan Leskull Award for Excellence in Urban Education, Mr. Malcolm Thomas.
Give it up for Malcolm. Give it up for Malcolm. You're doing the work. Malcolm is doing the work. Malcolm is doing the work. Malcolm is doing the work. Thank you, Malcolm, for what you do. Our second recipient has dedicated his life and career to issues of racial and social justice. His commitment to urban education has led to numerous initiatives, both in the School of Social Work and the Center on Race and Social Problems. And I know this person as well was, was essential in my joining the faculty here at the University of Pittsburgh, so I'm very grateful to you. Early in his career, Dean Davis was the first African American to earn a PhD from the dual degree program in social work and psychology at the University of Michigan, and the first African American in any discipline to be awarded tenure at Washington University in St. Louis. Mm. As Donald M. Henderson Professor and Dean at the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work and Director of the Center on Race and Social Problems, Larry Davis has engaged the university community and the Pittsburgh regions on conversations about educational disparities. Education is one of the center's seven areas of focus and has taken a central role in its activities. In 2010, the Center on Race and Social Problems hosted the largest race conference uh, in this country, in the U.S., which includes a focus, which included a focus on educational issues. In addition, the center hosts a series of series and, and summer institutes that attract wide community audiences. These programs have drawn nationally acclaimed speakers and researchers. Audiences have included principals, teachers, school administrators, and other community stakeholders. He has written, edited, edited or co-authored seven books and written numerous articles and editorials focused on the importance of race and poverty in life and educational outcomes. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in congratulating Dean Larry Davis. I almost said Dean Larry David. I mean, Dean Alan Lisko on that one. So, yeah. <laughs> let's take this moment to recognize both Malcolm Thomas and Dean Larry Davis once more for their outstanding work. I now invite uh, Dr. Gretchen Jenneret and Dr. Uh, Erica Gold Kestenberg to the podium. Thank you so much. Um, we're about to end this uh, wonderful session, but I want to invite you all to join us on Monday, October 26th at Woodland Hills High School in the library at the high school where we will continue this conversation. Uh, we'll have reflection into action fixing racial disproportionality in student discipline. At that discussion, it's a community discussion where we will have a panel um, of community leaders to help us think about how to move this conversation into action within the context um, that we work and operate within. So I'd really appreciate you joining us. You all got a flyer on your seat, so if you sat on it, grab it and make sure you, you um, join us in that conversation. I also want to acknowledge some of our um, sponsors that are here out. As you walked in, you may have passed by their tables, but we want to remind you to stop by and um, uh, fellowship with them as well before you leave out. Robert Morris University, A Plus Schools, Community College of Allegheny County, and Pat Patton, Pennsylvania Technical and Training Network. They were also here to support our endeavor in this important discussion. And finally, um, the Pitt Bookstore is outside with books um, for sale that are related to these critical issues, and there's a 10% discount on each of the books, so if you're interested in buying them, uh, they will be out there, so thank you. Is there, do we have a slide here for when? Do we have a question? 
And we also um, do this same lecture series in the spring as well. We just wanted to cue you in to uh, make sure you get this on your calendar for February 25th from 4 to 5.30 in this same room. We are going to have Dr. Maisha Wynn with us to continue this conversation in our overall theme of the school to prison pipeline. She focuses often um, more on African-American females, which we find we don't really talk enough about. And she'll be continuing the conversation that will also look at restorative justice practices and move into um, other ways that we can be dealing with what we've talked about today and, and really proactively. So thank you again for coming. We have uh, reception food over here. Please enjoy. And, and thank you again. Take good care.